This is my friend Tom Barkley. Um, we met, first met about, uh, what, three years ago? Three or four years ago, yeah. Three years ago. When I went to UC Merced, where he works in the library, and we had this fascinating conversation. I remember we were talking about how do people know, we talked about what's the nature of libraries now and in the, in the future. And I don't know if this was material to what you did, but you wrote this fantastic book, right? <laughs> uh, which is, I, I, oh, well, I, I got a, a you, slide. You have a slide I, for it? Oh, yeah, great. Okay. I'll pimp it myself. <laughs> He'll pitch his own book about fake news and propaganda. Uh, and I highly recommend you read it. It's, it I, I really enjoyed it. Don said I'd fall asleep on the plane. I did not. It was really marvelous. In fact, I really like the first chapter. Are you going to cover your first chapter? Sure. Yeah. I'm going to okay. talk about the tobacco. Tobacco. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, okay, what, that's my closer. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. You'll, you'll cover that at the very end. Anyway, this is Don Barkley from UC Merced here to talk about fake news and a curriculum for, for teaching people about that. Okay. Th thank you for inviting me, Dan, and, and thank you for coming. I oh, appreciate it. And uh, a, a standing invitation, come out to Merced and see us. We, Google has a facility at the former Castle Air Force Base, which is just a few miles from campus, actually. And that's where they're doing uh, driverless car testing out there. So they've hired a few of our engineering graduate students in the last few years. Everybody's very happy about that. So. Um, do come out and see us sometime. We're a growing campus, very interesting campus. We are the most diverse campus in the University of California system. And the last count, less than 10% of our students are non-Hispanic white. And it gives you an idea of how we're drawing people from all over the state and all kinds of folks are coming out. There. Anyway, enough uh, shilling for UC Merced. So the title, you can read the title for yourself. and. Uh, as, even though the phrase fake news appears in it twice, it's a phrase that I really kind of choke on a little bit when I say it because it's, as you know, it means different things to different people. It's become really politicized. Um, a, lot of, a lot of angst about what, what fake news really means. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But also, uh, as a librarian, when, when all of this hit in 2016, during the election, when fake news really blew up as a story, um, I was watching from the sidelines, and uh, I said, "Well, this is nothing new. This is what I've been teaching since I became a librarian 30 years ago, almost. Um, I'm teaching people to think about information, to think critically about the information they consume. In in our profession, we call it information literacy, is the term of art. And so it was nothing new to me. It's like, oh, so this is kind of an interesting thing because." For once, the thing I've been talking about all these years is everyone's paying attention to it. So that was a good thing about the fake news phenomena, a lot of bad things. Um, anybody want to try to get, answer my question here? How many times did that happen in 2015? Close, once. There was one article in 2015 that had the, the headline, the term fake news in the headline. So that's just how much it blew up in 2016. Anyway, when it all blew up, I. I was writing some, I'd written some articles for this publication called The Conversation, which is sort of an online chronicle of higher education kind of -ish publication. And um, don't worry, don't I, uh, really don't worry. Okay, all right. I, uh, <laughs> I, I pitched an idea for an article about libraries and fake news, and they said, oh, cool, write it. So I wrote it, and it got a lot of attention, and some other people asked me to write some articles, and then this publisher I worked with, and I'd previously, like about a year, what was it, 2014, I'd published a book with them about managing libraries in the, you know, futuristically, and it sold about three copies, including one to my sister. And I swore after I wrote that book that I was never going to write another book, it was a waste of time. And this is the book I swore I never would write, um, which Dan was referencing, which my, when I pitched it to my publisher, and I really thought they'd say no because the last book was such a, a dog. And boy, the dollar signs lit up because fake news was a hot topic. How fast can you write this book? So I wrote it, and it's gotten some attention and, and done pretty well for the kind of book it is. I'm not in Stephen King country, but I'm, it's doing OK. Better than any other book I've written. So um, one of the things I've observed since the book came out is it seems like some of the air has come out of the fake news story. The 2018 elections came and went, and there wasn't a lot of talk about fake news. People are on to the next thing. It's, it's not the topic that's on everyone's lips now. So it's, it's kind of lost some of that steam. And you might even ask, you know, was it a, 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 pan, a moral panic? Um, there was a lot of talk about a lot of hand-wringing, 
uh, this is a couple of articles that were published after the election sort of saying, well, maybe people were a little bit overworked about it. And of course, a couple of articles don't mean a conclusion that, you know, this is, that it didn't have any effect or, or, or not. But it's going to be, it's going to take a while for people to decide, did it really sway the election? Did it really change our culture? Lots of questions to be answered. Um, but we know fake news has some really terrible consequences, and not just here in the U.S., that um, there's been a case of a number of lynchings in, in India because of fake stories that were published on WhatsApp and people got excited. And of course, the people who were portrayed as the bad people were the outsiders of the community and terrible things have happened. So it's still important. And students today, I think, need to be taught about information, whether you call it fake news, disinformation, information literacy, and I don't have to tell people at Google, things have changed in the last 20, 30 years, including the sheer amount of information we have to deal with, the speed and low cost at which information we created, reproduced, and delivered. Think about it. If you wanted to start a conspiracy theory in 1980, how would you do it? You'd have to have some money. You'd have to have some resources. Even if you're going to Kinko's and making copies of your manifesto, about how textbook publishers conspired to assassinate President Kennedy, because we all know how evil they are, right? Um, you would have ha it would have cost you money, and then you would have had to deliver it, and that would have cost you money and time. And you couldn't do what you do today, which would be to sit there and just do, uh, you know, post after post after post, meme after meme after meme, Instagram after Instagram after Instagram about how textbook publishers killed Kennedy. You couldn't do that in 1980. And of course, we know that information can be altered today in ways that it couldn't in the past, and, and that's very obvious, I'm sure, to people here. So how do we change the curriculum? Well, I think one of the problems with the curriculum is that information is not very important in the curriculum. Thinking about what it is, how it's created, how it's distributed, how it is, because it's created by human beings, how there's always bias in all information. Um, and that's typically in, in, you know, if you go through K-12 and even through your bachelor's degree, maybe a couple of times you, the librarian came in and talked for 50 minutes about information literacy, maybe in a history class, maybe in a writing class, you got a little bit of stuff about information. Maybe one of your professors, you know, in your senior year said, well, look, if you're going to seriously do research in non-imaging non optics, there are 10 journals that matter and everything else is garbage. Just stick to those 10 journals and you'll be okay. That's information literacy, but it's not. Um, so what we have to do is integrate this learning into the curriculum from the beginning, and we have to put information in context for people so it's not just, I got to get these five good sources for my paper so I get a good grade. It has to be a, a lot more than that, and I think you know, there's a lot, a, a lot to be learned there. And creating the context to me means teaching students about the history of information, past and to the present day, so they really understand what it is and how it comes to be. Um, of course, going back to the fake news, what it's not, it's not whatever you don't want to hear. That's a certain politician's definition of fake news. Um, and it's not something entirely new. It's been around for a long time. Lying. So fake news is a way of lying, and lying's been around forever. People lie for all kinds of reasons to gain power, to gain money, to deflect blame. Uh, there's some good evidence that animals can lie to an extent. So nothing new about lying. That's what fake news is. We've done that forever. There's also what I call mercenary fake news. It's when people do fake news just to make a buck. This is, I know you can't really read this. This is the New York Sun from April 13th, 1844. And the article on the second column from the left is about a Steering balloon Victoria that crossed the Atlantic Ocean in three days with human beings on board. It's all a lie. It's, it's just a made-up story, very typical of the kind of things you would see in 19th century newspapers. The author made it up to make money. The publisher ran it to sell papers and make money. Did people really believe it? Hard to say. Maybe some people did, maybe some people didn't. You know, some people might have just read it and laughed and thought it was a funny story, like reading something in The Onion. The, there are lots of stories like this. This one is notable because it was written by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, this is a cartoon. Um, the the Finisicle, uh, I didn't pronounce it very well, newspaper proprietor 
making all this money and he's got all these minions running around. This would be the height of the yellow journalism period. In the upper left hand corner there's a guy in a bowler hat and his piece of paper says fake news on it. So even the term is not that new. It's been around. Um, a little bit of fake news from the 80s. Uh, Hillary was running with Bigfoot. Maybe if she'd done that in 16, she would have won. Who knows? It's a crazy world we live in. Um, another form of fake news that I think re students really need to be taught about is advertising. It's everywhere, you know, online. My kids are always online and they're getting bombarded with all kinds of messages. Some of them are, are obvious advertisements, a pop up ad, but some of it are things like these, you know, YouTube video celebrities and, and Viners and all. I don't know all the terminology. I'm old. Uh, I should know it better, but these people who are like, you know, talking about things and it's an Instagram models and stuff like that who are being paid to place products and put them in front of people in very pretty subtle, sophisticated ways where they don't even realize they're being advertised to. So that's an, a kind of for-profit fake news, mercenary fake news people need to know about. Clickbait, we know how that works. That's as old as magazines. You know, if you go look at a women's ladies home journal from the 80s, all kinds of clickbait headlines to get you to pick up that magazine and look at it in a newsstand and while well, you're standing in line at the grocery store and maybe buy it. It's the same kind of thing. You know, you click on the thing about Ivanka, Ivanka, Ivanka and you know, the person gets paid for their clicks. Okay, so mercenary fake news, different kind of fake news is propaganda. This is called the Behistun inscription. It dates from 515 BCE. It's in Iran. It's about Darius the Great and how great he is. I guess he's making Persia great again. I don't know what he's doing. But this is the oldest known written example of propaganda. We're pretty sure it probably existed in other forms before this. And it's existed you know, all through history, Roman times, Dark Ages, whatever. There's, there's propaganda. Um, so it's very old. It's been around a long time. This is probably the, you know, the poster child for the evils of propaganda. Uh, no need to go into detail. but they. If you study this period in history, you know that everybody else was doing propaganda too. The Soviets, the US, the British, the Japanese. It was very common. Um, a more modern form of propaganda. And this you know, begs the question, well, what is propaganda? Maybe some people look at this and go, this isn't propaganda. This is telling the truth about natural medicine and coming out against the big lie that's Western medicine. Other people would go, oh, no, it's just crazy anti-scientific propaganda. So propaganda can t depend on your point of view. It's not easy to, to say what is and what isn't, and it will always be debated. Um, you might have heard about these during the 2016 election. Teenagers in Velas, Macedonia were creating websites to get clicks and get money. They were making a lot of money for them, for, well, for anybody, but especially for them in an impoverished country. Um, they found out quickly that the Donald Trump, pro-Donald Trump, Anna Hillary was getting the most money. Um, and the initial story was they were just doing it for the money. They didn't care about the election. And as far as we know, they didn't have any stake in the election. Since the election has come out that maybe um, they were being prompted by people in the U.S., conservatives in the U.S. and people in, in Russia who were feeding them information to, so they could create these websites. Uh, so it's kind of propaganda and it's kind of mercenary meets each other. It's not always clear cut. And of course, humor is an important part of, of fake news. This is Jonathan Swift's <coughs> modest proposal, which every once in a while you still hear somebody reads it and thinks it's, he's really advocating eating children. Um, the Onion, everybody's familiar with that. Every once in a while you hear a story about, especially a foreign newspaper has picked up an Onion story and rerun it as the truth. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this one, DHMO. It's about the horrors of this chemical called dihydrogen monoxide. And everything on the site is true. Dihydrogen monoxide, of course, is water. Um, but it's, it's a parody of the sort of scare websites that we see a, a lot. Uh, this is Landover Baptist Church. It's um, satirizing the extremes of uh, evangelical religion. You, someone might think this was a real church website um, at first glance. Um, it's, and it's funny, it is, but like a lot of humor, maybe not so funny. If you were not evangelical, you might not think it was funny. If this were mocking an American mosque, it might not be so funny. If it was stereoty you know, stereotyping things about Islamic people that are often very hateful and harmful, 
maybe not so funny. Um, so again, humor an important part of, of what happens in fake news and you know things it's very easy when things are out of context to see something that was intended to be a joke and it's not. All, the other thing that you see that's really damaging sometimes is people will write really hateful stuff and when people come at them they go, oh, I was just being funny, it was just a satire, but it really wasn't. Um, so if we're going to change the curriculum, how can we do it? If, if um, we're going to work thinking about information into the schools, well, one approach is, is very to take very practical approaches, to give people tools, if you will, for dealing with fake information or disinformation. This is an example of a, a tool that's, that's really very useful. I think it's very useful, but it's, it's very, and very practically oriented. This is created by IFLA, which is the International Library Federation. And um, it's just got some basic advice, and maybe everybody who's reading this is going, oh yeah, of course, you know, I do that. That's obvious stuff. But it's something that you kind of have to, you have to learn. You don't figure it out on your own. And it, it's very useful, and I often share this with people. I share it with students and teachers and so on. Um, it's in the public domain, so anybody can use it, reuse it. Um, so it's, it's useful stuff. It's very practically oriented. Of course, the problem is you have to be exposed to it. If you don't, if it doesn't get in the curriculum, if nobody ever tells students do these things and teaches them how to do them and has them practice doing these things, they're never going to learn to do them. Uh, basic fact checking. Um, you know, how do you find out if something's real? When I saw this, I thought this has to be a lie. There cannot be two minor league pitchers named Brady Feigl who both had Tommy John surgery at the same time and are pitching in the minor leagues, that, that has to be, and they look alike, it has to be fake. As far as I can tell, I, I checked a lot of very credible sources, this is real, you know, but you have, to, when you see something like this, you really have to check it out, because the more amazing it is, the more likely it is it's not real. I, I really had a hard time believing this one, but it, as far as I can tell, unless somebody's really doing a really big practical joke, this is true. So fact checking, how do you fact check, how do you check a fact? How do you go to, what, where do you go to check a fact in a world full of information? And you can talk about things like, um, you know, fact checking sites like Snopes. I'm sure everybody's familiar with Snopes, Pointer, um, PolitiFact. There's a lot of them out there. In fact, there's last time I saw somebody did it in the county, there was something like 150 sites claiming to be fact checking sites. So those are useful if you know how to use them. If you ideally look at more than one to kind of double check things. If you're aware that people can set themselves up to be a fact-checking site when they're just the opposite, um, those are useful tools. But you've got to be taught how to use those. Um, you know, even you know, it, it takes a while to learn what 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 tools are generally reliable and which aren't. You know, um, the you know the Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, generally very reliable, but not again not perfect. You have to learn how to how to work those things and how to compare maybe what the Britannica says with what some other source says. You need to teach people about information overload. I've kind of alluded to this one already. Um, all these things are part of too much information. We're getting hit with these fire hoses of information. How do you figure out what's true and what's not? How do you understand how it makes you um, feel? You know, um, the fact that there's there's so much noise that there's um, things are out of context to understand how to deal with these this is an important thing that students have to be made familiar with and uh, learn how to deal with they need to learn about the tricks the basic logical fallacies and you know um, some of these of course are so old they still have Latin names ad hominem etc cetera, etc cetera. but you have to we have to start teaching students and I think at a young age about all of these different tricks so they understand what they are, how they work, and prepare themselves to deal with them. Uh, altering information, I've, I've got that down at the bottom there, um, and you video folks will appreciate this. Uh-oh, no sound. Oh, darn it. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I guess the sound isn't working on this, um, but it's, uh, it's, it sounds like Barack Obama, and he's saying some kind of outrageous things. And then it, it uh, in a minute here, it will transcend into um, Jordan Peele, the actor who's doing Obama's voice, and it's um, it's a, a deep fakes video. And Peele then talks about how 
easy it is for people to manipulate images and video, and we have to be prepared as people going into space. I'm sorry you can't hear it. If you haven't seen it, uh, you can look it up online. It's all over the place. Just do uh, Jordan Peele, Obama, and you'll see it, and you can hear what's being said. So, you know, this is where, you know, I saw it on video with my own eyes. Did you really? Um, we have to teach students to be aware of that, to how do you, when you see something that looks like it's real, that looks like it's President Obama saying things, or Donald Trump saying something, or whoever, um, how, do you, how do you then make sure that's not fake? How do you learn to trust anything? Um, the other thing you have to do, I think that's really important, is you have to talk to students about the emotions that are involved in information and the information they, they, they process. That part of what happens with people getting you know, worked up about fake news or falling for fake news, falling for bad information, is that it appeals to our emotions in a real visceral way. Um, these three emotions are the big ones. Something that really makes you angry, something that really makes you afraid, something that makes you feel really happy or specifically smug about yourself, those are the times when you let down your guard. Oh my God, I'm so mad at what those people have done. Oh, I'm so afraid. There's 4,000 drug crazed El Salvadorans heading for our border and they're going to be at my doorstep in three days. I'm really afraid and I'm not stopping to think about how crazy that idea really is. You know, or, um, you know, President Trump has solved all our economic woes. We're in good shape for the next hundred years. Everything's good. I was right all along. I knew he was the best guy for the job. Those kind of feelings make it really hard for people to analyze and think carefully about what they're talking about. And so we have to confront students with information at a young age. You know, again, how young? Well, if, I think if a kid is old enough to understand how playground rumors work, they're old enough to understand how fake news works. It's kind of the same thing on a big international scale. So we have to, to give them examples of this, and it has to be all across the curriculum again. It can't just be a librarian who comes in one time in their school career. Um, this is an example of one. This is um, Battle for Britain. And the British National Party is a far-right British anti-immigrant party. Um, and this was a poster they put up. And um, does anyone know what the second most common language in English, England and Wales is after English? Anybody know? French. Polish. Because there are so many Polish immigrants. And the, Britain, the British National Party treats Polish immigrants the way certain Americans treat Mexican immigrants. They don't speak our language. They don't eat our food. They don't follow our customs. They're here to take our jobs. They work for cheap. They're a threat to our way of life and our country, blah, blah, blah. It's the same story. You could just swip, swap out his, Mexican or Hispanic for Polish, and it's exactly the same language. Anyway, they they had this campaign called Battle for Britain, which was playing on Battle of Britain, where the, the, the RAF defeated the Luftwaffe using the Spitfire airplane. And they had a picture of a Spitfire. And I, what, the way this came to my attention was, it was sent to me and somebody said, guess what, the Spitfire they showed was from a Polish Spitfire squadron. And I was like, yeah, of course, because those people are a bunch of knuckleheads and I hate them. So I was going to share this with some people and I said, I was so, you know, so smug about it. I was ready to share it. I got, oh, wait a minute. Do I know that that's true? Do I know that this is a Polish Spitfire? I did some fact checking and it is a Polish Spitfire. Hooray. But I was totally prepared to share that with people and possibly tell a lie, even about people I think are bad people, because it fit everything I want to believe, that Polish people are good, that we, you know, we need this immigrant population in all of our countries to make the world stronger, that these people are a bunch of knuckleheads who don't even know their own history. They're going around talking about British culture and history, and they don't even know what's going on. Anyway, but that's, that's what happens when you're feeling smug about something. <clears throat> I think the other thing we have to be really careful about is that, uh, the fans of the Big Lebowski are laughing over here, the video people know this, um, that one of the dangers of fake news and bad misinformation is that it can cause people to become really cynical. And there's a real danger in that. It's sort of the, the opposite of the, of the smug feeling of, you know, Yahoo, I'm always right, to, yeah, nobody's right. And where does that leave you? How do you base decisions on your feelings, you know, whatever you like, whatever's appealing to you at the moment. 
without regard for science, without regard for other people's thoughts, without regard for history, you know, my, your gut feelings, my gut feeling, I'll be very honest with you, my gut feeling tells me the world is flat. If I went by my gut feelings, I'd say the world is flat. But there's all this other information out there which I accept, which tells me it's not flat. Um, I doubt that I would have figured out that the world was round on my own. Maybe, but I kind of doubt it. Um, so we have to be careful about teaching students to deal with this. Oh, everything's a lie. Everything's socially constructed. Everything is about somebody making a dollar. Everything's a conspiracy. You know, whatever you want to put on it. So why believe anything? Just do what you feel like. You know, uh, mix and match your feelings. And that's not a very good place for people to be coming from. We have things too like confirmation bias. This is a big one. This is a, a, a reference to my, my childhood and early adulthood. I grew up in Idaho. And I grew up in Boise, Idaho, which is in Ada County. <clears throat> and Ada County license plates have the letter 1A on them. The neighboring county, Canyon County, has the letters 2C. So you always knew what county somebody was from. And um, Canyon County was a smaller county, more rural. Boise was the big giant city of like 100,000 people, the biggest city in the state, the metropolis. Um, and so the, the thing that you heard all the time and believed, and I believed it when I was young, is that people from Canyon County are terrible drivers. They just screw up all the time. They're always cut in front of you. They turn wrong. They, go, they are just bad drivers. Watch out for people from Canyon County. And there may have been some truth to that because they were probably in a city that they weren't as familiar with. It was bigger than their cities. Maybe they had a little trouble navigating it, like me when I'm in San Francisco driving or LA and I'm, I really don't know my way around. But I think a lot of it was confirmation bias. You know, a car with an Ada County plate does something, a 1A, and it's just whatever. Someone with a Canyon County plate does it, and it's like, ugh, those idiots. Suspicion's confirmed. They're all terrible drivers. And we see this all the time. And this is kind of a funny example. So what? Canyon County versus Ada County. But when it gets into things like racial prejudices and nationalistic things, and it can get really terrible. So we have to teach students about how this works on their mind and how, how they, they can overcome confirmation bias. Um, another tool I think I can use that we use too is we can, I think we can teach people about information by kind of depoliticizing it and also by, um, by giving examples of things that make them, that attack their perspective. That is, when a millennial sees something like this, they go, that's just old people like Donald up there being stupid and saying dumb stuff about this. It's not true. And here's why. I can give you all these reasons why this is a lie. You're very good at, at analyzing things that go against you. Less so about things in your favor. You know, if you, if you love Donald Trump, it's very easy to, to criticize things that criticize him. If you hate Donald Trump, it's very easy to accept things that make him look bad. So using things that are important to students, and I use millennials as the example because we have a lot of, you know, I work with a lot of millennials at my university, but it could be any group where you, where you start, if you say to millennials, well, you guys are all lazy, right? That's a proven fact. Oh, no, and here's why. And, and they're very good at, at doing that kind of analysis. Um, so I think we have to, to, we can do things like that, create exercises like that for students where they learn how false information works and they learn how these sweeping stereotypes about people are not true, that they don't really hold. <clears throat> so the things I talked about so far are kind of practical things. You could see you know, a teacher doing that in a, in a middle school or high school classroom, in a college classroom even, of coming up with some interesting, challenging exercises to get students to really think about information. Um, and it, it, it's, it happened some. I, mean, I, I, had, I can remember some examples of that from when I was growing up where we, got, we had to choose between different sources of information and so on. Um, but it doesn't happen enough. And then beyond that, I think changing the curriculum means some deep critical thinking about information that gets into a higher level of thinking. And to really approach... I think the problem of, of disinformation, fake news, it's a wicked problem. And you guys may be familiar with that term, wicked problem. But it's, it's a problem where there's probably no, perf there's no perfect solution. 
Um, there's only better and worse solutions to it, and it's something you're just going to have to keep working at. Healthcare, for example, is a is a wicked problem. There's no perfect ideal solution. Um, there's lots of better and worse solutions, and we have to keep working at it to figure it out. So how do we we do that? Um, one of the things that I that I've done some work with is called the Framework for Information Literacy for Higher Education, which was created by the um, ACRL, Association of College and Research Libraries, which is part of the American Library Association. And prior to this, there were sort of guidelines for, for information literacy in higher education that were just kind of a bunch of sort of practical checklist things, the kind of, sort of like what I was already talking about. But, you know, students can tell a journal from a magazine. You know, um, students can identify scholarly information. Just kind of a, a, an ongoing list of things like that. And a few years ago, they switched it to this framework, which is much higher level thinking. And it was controversial because a lot of people saw this and went, oh, this is going to be hard to teach. And this is going to, this is really not as clear as what we had before. But it, I, I think it's a step in the right direction because it's, te it's teaching college students when it's applied to really, really think about information in that critical way to think about more than just, I got to get 10 articles for my paper, and they got to be from scholarly sources, and as long as the source is scholarly, all is good. If they're from these 10 journals that my professor listed, I'm going to be OK. That's all that matters. Um, and so this is not being applied everywhere, and it's not being applied enough. I mean, mostly, if you, if you went around and asked people in higher education, what's the framework for information literacy, the chance that anyone who wasn't an academic librarian would know what it was is pretty slim. We've got to get this out there where sociologists and scientists and historians and other people are thinking about teaching information this way. And it's hard. It's hard to teach this way. Because when you start saying things like authorities construct and contextual, excuse me, Professor, does that mean that stuff in scholarly journals isn't always right? Well, yeah. Oh, OK. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's more to it than that. <laughs> That's hard. That's hard to deal with. Professor, does that mean something like sometimes something I read on the internet or found on Wikipedia could be right? Well, yeah, sometimes. Okay, all the time. Well, no, 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 no. You know, it's a very complex thing to, to deal with. But it's really important in the information age. And why is it important in the information age? Uh, when, we, when the world went into the industrial age, which started at around 1750, 1760, really took off, Suddenly, all these, these manufacturing processes became really important. And they were creating all these new products that were much cheaper and better, actually, than what had been created before. And at the time, the Industrial Revolution was really gathering steam, uh, pun, right? Um, higher education was mostly a, a classic liberal arts education. It was the classics, literally the classics, religion. Um, and then suddenly people were saying, we've got to get science, and we've got to get engineering into the curriculum of higher education because this is what everybody's doing now. This is what's driving the world. And it was very hard to do that. They didn't want to let those things interfere with teaching Greek, teaching Latin, all these things they've been doing for years and years and years. It was, you know, it's comfortable to keep on teaching people the same way. Well, we're, in the we're going into the information age now. We we're already in it, and we're, we're moving further into it. The industrial age is still around. There are still plenty of people who work in industrial settings. There are plenty of jobs where if you brought somebody back from 1850, they'd walk around and go, oh, yeah, I, I recognize that as a job. I see, I see what they're doing there. I, I get that. But increasingly, we see people working in information, people like you. And if somebody from 1850 saw your job, they'd go, what the, hell, what the hell are you doing? What is that? Does that work, really? You get paid to do that? And we're going to see, well, people from the 21st century say that too, right? But anyway, um, the point is that more and more people are making their living off information. And that's going to keep happening. I mean, it's not saying that industrialization is going to go away. It's not. There'll still be industrial things happening. But more and more stuff is going to be about information. And we have to have students trained to think about information the same way an industrial world needs to have people trained in STEM fields. And it took a while to get the STEM fields into higher education. And now today, quite honestly, STEM fields dominate higher education. No surprise, right? That's where all the money is. 
well, we've got to get information in there too. You know, uh, STEMI, S-T-E-M-I, information, has got to be part of the curriculum. And we need things like this to move us forward, this kind of high-level thinking. And uh, some colleagues of mine at UC Merced are, ha have done some focus groups with students um, getting some information about what they know about information, their level of information literacy. And they're talking about collaborations with students involving this high-level thinking about information. And they say, one of the quotes from their unpublished paper is, there's opportunity to discuss information literacy, not just as a set of mechanical skills, but rather as a discipline with core concepts and dispositions. We, as a society and as high, in higher education, we need to get students thinking about information in this way. It's, yeah, it's a commodity that they use, but they've really got to think about all of the implications of how it's created, how it's transmitted, how it changes. You know, simply the idea of scholarship as a conversation. You know, it's not just finding 10 articles from the right journals. It's much more than that. We've got to get people thinking this on this high level. And it's really complicated because here's an example of a predatory journal. And if you're not familiar with these, they're journals that charge authors a fee to have their articles published online. And they look like real journals, and they pass themselves off as real journals. They claim to have peer review and editorial boards but they don't have anything like that. They're the scourge of, of scholarly information today because they, they look just like the real thing. And in fact, at UC Merced, the other couple of weeks ago, I was talking to some students, and I said, this is a printed scholarly journal. And I had to go find this in, like, in our throwaway room because we don't have any printed scholarly journals in our library. We're a new university. We never had a periodical room because when we were thinking about what our library is going to be back in 2002, I said to my boss, we don't need a periodical room. They're done. Print periodicals are done. And I was right. But the, I asked the students, have you ever seen one of these? And nobody raised their hand. They'd never seen a print periodical. So how do they distinguish that thing I'm looking at on screen from cell or nature or science or name your journal or RNA? It's really hard. So, you know, one of the approaches is, well, let's, you know, we'll create lists of bad, of these bad uh, predatory journals, and we'll make sure that people check these predatory journals, and that'll be the answer to our problem. You know, even though they look a lot and they claim to have peer review and so on, they look like a real thing, we'll just teach students to tell the difference. Well, here's the problem. You can pay to have your article published in a scholarly journal. You can also pay to have your article published and sell. Open access, pay to have it open access, which means anybody can access it immediately. It still goes through peer review and all of that, unlike the predatory journal. But the fact is, the model looks very much the same. Somebody paid money to have their article made available. And here's the other tricky thing about predatory journals. There's no law that says an article in a predatory journal can't be a great article couldn't be the next Einstein, you know, um, theory of relativity article. It could be published in a scholarly journal by some scholar who just for whatever reason couldn't get it into a regular journal, paid $1,200 and some journal based in Mumbai published it for $1,200 and put it out there. It could be a great article. So you can't just, you know, do the simple, you know, it's one or zero. It's in a good journal or it's not in a good journal. And we know that journals have different levels of quality and thoroughness and so on. So just to say something's predatory or not is really kind of a made-up distinction. So this is, this is, again, getting my point why we have to make critically thinking about information really important and, and a priority in higher education because people are living in this world of information where it is so, so confusing and, and it's really hard to tell. I think another thing we have to do is we have to teach students the idea of getting away from this sort of one and zero. It's either true or it's not. Information exists on a continuum. There's not much information that's 100% false, and there's not much information that's 100% true. Um, and what we have to think about is the stakes of what we're dealing with. How important is the decision I'm going to make based on this information? The more important the decision, the more certain I want to be about my information. The less important the decision is, 
less important. And I'm going to give you an example here. Okay, so I have uh, some Idaho Spud Bites here. Idaho Spud is a candy bar that's made in Boise, Idaho. And it doesn't have any potatoes in it. It's, I'll tell you, it's marshmallow and coconut. And I'll actually pass this around in case anybody has an allergy. You can check and make sure there's nothing in it that, that will make you sick. But I'll tell you, Idaho Spud Bar, it's a great candy bar. I love Idaho Spuds. I grew up eating them. And probably nobody in this room has ever had one. They're really good. I love them. <laughs> so based on my inf recommendation, that's the only information you have, you can choose whether you're going to have a spud bite or two or three. I got way more than I need. <laughs> or not. But it's a low stake decision. You saw me eat one, so they're probably not poison. Um, that. <laughs> um, so it's an easy decision to make. You don't have a lot of information. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to bite and go, ugh, coconut. I don't like it. Or the best thing that's going to happen is you're going, oh, I know spuds. Where do I get more? Okay, I found these mushrooms on my way in this morning. I think they're okay. Go ahead and eat one. That's a high stakes decision, obviously. <laughs> and you're going to want to make sure that I know what I'm talking about. And in fact, not just I know what I'm talking about. You want to, like, what are your sources of information that have you? You can put those in a break room or whatever when we're for later. People can try, like, what, the, what are those? <laughs> so, okay, it's kind of a simple example, but. It is the kind of thing we have to teach students about. You, you know, one of the things that leads to that cynical, we believe in nothing Lebowski attitude is, I don't have time to check everything out. I don't have time. I, don't, I can't check every fact. You can't, nobody can. But you need to be careful to check the facts that are really important. And also I think there's a community sort of responsibility. In, and going back to my example from the British National Party, I want to call them National Front, that's not exactly, they're close to that, but that's not what they are that when you're going to share something with people who may be influenced by you, you have to be really careful. You have to think about the community you're in. Do I want to be responsible for pr pr propagating false information? I don't. And I think that's a sense of, of social responsibility that's also part of this higher level thinking that we need to be teaching students about. So anyway, um, Idaho Spud, Mushroom, low risk, high risk. <laughs> so I'm going to close with my little an example of why facts matter. And, and people say, we live in a post-truth world, we live in an alternative facts world. I say no. I say our important decisions still need to be based on the best information. No information is perfect, but on the best information we have. Okay, so set the clock back to 1964. It's February. Um, it's actually January, sorry, January 1964. About two months before President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. I actually, I'm old enough I remember that. I actually remember seeing President Kennedy when I was five years old in person. I remember him. Seeing, he was riding by in a car. I was not the kindergartner on the grassy knoll. Um, <laughs> and um, about a month later, the Beatles would be on Ed Sullivan for the first time. So if you were living in the United States at this time, you'd certainly know about Kennedy's assassination. You might not have heard of the Beatles, quite, quite possibly. So the, the Surgeon General had a, a committee work on this report about smoking and health, and they'd come up with this really devastating evidence about lung cancer, emphysema, low birth weight babies, heart disease, the whole nine yards. Now, it wasn't the first finding that says smoking is bad for you, but it was a really influential one. It was really important. And the Surgeon General, and this is a picture of the press conference where he announced the, the release of this report. Uh, he did it on a Saturday for two reasons. He didn't want there to be a reaction in the stock market. And when Kennedy was assassinated, the stock market just th went to, the, to the zero practically, just took a dive. He didn't want that to happen because of his report. Also, by having it on a Saturday, it would appear in the Sunday papers the next day, which were a hugely important source of information at that time. And it would also give a little bit of time before it showed up on Walter Cronkite and Huntley and Brinkley in the, the evening news. So he was very shrewd about how he did it. Um, so he released a report, and we all know what happened. It really launched off in the United States and really worldwide this whole 
we've got to do something about tobacco products. We've got to do something about smoking. It really, it really kicked it off. But suppose that that report came out in the time of social media. What might have happened? So this is all alternative history. Well, first of all, you would have had people creating memes to attack the Surgeon General's report. And these are actual pro-smoking memes that you can find on the internet. And the favorite one, of course, is Adolf Hitler was against tobacco, so anybody who's against tobacco is worse than Hitler, right? The internet's favorite person. Um, these are made up ones that I created, but if there had been Twitter, you probably would have seen things like this. People tweeting about um, you know, how the Surgeon General's report is fake, and you know, it's, it's an attack on men's rights, and it's the nanny state at work, blah, blah, blah. Um, your drunken uncle on Facebook would have got on. I've been smoking for X number of years. I remember one of, one of my uncles telling me, I think it was 40 years he'd been smoking, and he was dead of lung cancer in less than a year. Um, but, you know, that's, that's what happened to those guys. They got wiped out by it. Um, <clears throat> probably seeing clickbait um, articles. Probably some fake video. Um, you remember the Acorn fake video that took down the social service agency, it was totally fake, proven to be fake, and nonetheless it caused Congress to defund Acorn. Um, you'd probably have seen things like that. Might have gotten some foreign intelligence agencies involved in it if they thought that fanning the flames of this thing would have destabilized the United States in some way. Oh, predatory journals. What a great place to publish fake scientific articles about how smoking doesn't really hurt you. Maybe even tobacco companies might be funding scientists who want to write articles like that. No peer review, no editorial process, just pay your money and your article goes in. Very good. Of course, the news 24-7 uh, news cycle. No waiting for Huntley and Brinkley on Monday night at 6 o'clock. Um, just 24-7, around the clock, people commenting, experts coming in, experts coming in to debunk the Surgeon General's report. I can't believe this asking. How many people know who Huntley and Brinkley were? Nobody does. Do you know who, you know who Walter Cronkite was? Yeah. Huntley and Brinkley were in main competition. They were the NBC. Yeah. So, sorry. I'm... <laughs> Back in my day, <laughs> we'd get on a wagon and ride into town to watch Walter Cronkite. No. Uh, <laughs> The kerosene power TV. Uh, it was also an election year. Lyndon Johnson was running against Barry Goldwater. So if all the social media churn was happening, Barry Goldwater might have decided, hey, I can pick up some votes in the tobacco states, which at that time were Democratic, mostly. Um, I could pick up some votes there and get some people on my side. Now. Barry Goldwater actually was a dedicated non-smoker his entire life. Lyndon Johnson smoked periodically throughout his life, so I'm not going to I'm not going to throw that charge at Barry, at Barry Goldwater. He was a non-smoker, but imagine you know if Johnson was feeling the heat, and he might have maybe before the report came out, if he thought the heat was going to happen, or once the heat happened, he might have gone to the Surgeon General and said, "Not in an election year, not now. Let's let's put this. We got." Vietnam, we've got the war on poverty. I got other things I want to achieve. I don't want to get embroiled in a tobacco fight. Let's just put this on the back burner. And that would have been terrible. If we were still smoking like it was 1965, if this room was a full of blue smoke right now and I had an ashtray right up here, oh, that'd be nice. Uh, <laughs> no. Nobody, even people who believe that, you know, regulating smoking is a bad thing, it's nanny state, whatever. Nobody really wants the world to be smoking like it was in 1965. It would have been a public health disaster if that report had been quashed by the forces of social media, fake news, whatever you want to call it. This is real history. Um, chairman of, uh, one of the chairman of Philip Morris, we don't accept the idea that there's harmful agents in tobacco, immediately after the report came out, stated this. Um, this is from the journal uh, Circulation. And the, it was a study of media, um, uh, of how um, tobacco companies responded to the certain, to anti-smoking campaigns. And uh, this was published in 2007, but the meat of it is they found the tobacco industry did everything they could, no surprise, to 
try to make people think that smoking was not harmful, that secondhand smoke wasn't harmful, and that the new products they were creating were actually safe. It doesn't surprise anybody. And this is what happened because of the Surgeon General's report. That smoking in the United States went from, in 1965, which was the high for smoking, it was almost 45% of adults in the country smoked, to today it's about 18%, and they think they can get it down to about 12%. They figure that's probably rock bottom. There's always going to be that group of people who, who are going to smoke regardless. And that's a huge public health victory. Um, and that's an example to me, and the kind of example you can use with students, and I have used it with students, to say, this is why facts matter. This is why we really have to pay attention to reality and not just have a post-truth world and a post-fact world where whatever we want, whatever we feel is true, and whatever we dislike is not. And I think that this is part of what we have to be teaching as well. It's it's certainly, you know, again, there's, there's techniques, there's tools you can use, but also there's a philosophy there and a high level of criti critical thinking that we need to be teaching. So people are really thinking about their information. So when they use Google, which is a great tool and we all love it, they understand, okay, I'm getting information here. Now the real thinking begins, that finding information and using information isn't just typing something into the Google search bar and whatever comes to the top through whatever mysterious algorithm is out there making that happen is the best information. That I need to think very carefully and I need to think about how important is the decision I'm going to make and then to peg the reliability, the trustworthiness of the information I use to that decision. That's what we have to be teaching them and that's what I have to say today. Thank you. We've got a whole bunch of video guys here in the back. Yeah. I'm just curious about um, what your thoughts are about the ability of video to sort of bypass or circumvent our, our, our critical filters. Is there something magical about video that exceeds in its uh, kind of uh, convincing capabilities better than print, or what do you think? Oh, do me? That's you. <laughs> well, okay, well, I thought maybe those guys would answer. Well, I, I mean, I think we've been taught to trust video. You know, we, we uh, you know, going back to the Kennedy assassination, you know, the Zapruder video. You know, we've been taught to, to think about every single frame of that as if each frame is total reality. And in a way it is, we, as far as we know, it's real. You know, unless somebody clips some footage out of it or something, you know, as, as far as we know, we, that, that kind of thinking about, you know, see it with my own eyes, um, it's very, you know, it's very immediate, and certainly, you know, the power of YouTube is you see something with your own eyes, you see somebody, some kid using this product, you see some attractive person wearing these clothes, that's got to be true, right, that's real, that will be, happen for me, and so that's extremely powerful, um, you know, again, there's, it, it's such a, a fraught question because then you've got the, the cynicism side of it. It's like, oh, they can fake any video. Oh, you know, then I can just disbelieve it. Oh, they're using gas and butter. That's just fake video. So, you know, I think how we, the tools we have for trying to determine when video's been manipulated, and, you know, I think if you had a, a professor of photography up here, they'd be saying, well, all images are manipulated because it's from where we stand. It's the it's the person's perspective. If I stand over here, it looks different. You know, there's, a, there's stories about um, Civil War photographers like Matthew Brady would rearrange bodies on the battlefield mm -hmm. to make a certain image. That's, that's messing with reality. Yeah. Right. I have a question. So I love your, your approach about thinking about how we can put this into the curriculum. A lot of us, me personally, I'm dealing with, you know, maybe stakeholders who are too selective. Or even personal relationships where they might have a, a fallacy in their arguments. Uh -huh. And so how do we influence those people? We can't tell them to go back to school or no. send them a pamphlet. Yeah, how, how do we deal with, with people who are already out of school? Out of school? Right. That's, that's an excellent question. I, I think, um, you know, maybe, it's, you know, in some ways a lost cause. Your drunken uncle who posts crazy stuff on Facebook, um, Maybe there's maybe we just have to wait for them to, to move on. Well, <coughs> I, I, I think um, 
you know, when I talk about helping students think about information critically, I mean, we are, I think we're seeing in the younger generation some, some savvy about information that, that their elders don't have that because they grow up with one of these in their hand, watching things in video and Instagram, they do have a sense of, of cynicism about it that maybe older people don't. Mm -hmm. So I think they're, you know, give them some credit. They, they are aware of that. I think they need to have some guidance in how to turn that, that natural sort of skepticism, is this real, into something more, you know, thoughtful and, and um, you know, more planned out than just simply, I kind of believe it, I kind of don't. Um, you know, one of the things I, you know, what I've been hearing too is like, um, kids don't use Facebook anymore. My kids don't use Facebook. That that's considered an old person's platform. So, you know, maybe the old drunken uncles like me are off on Facebook ranting about Donald Trump and Hillary or whatever we're ranting about, and the young people aren't even paying attention to it. It's, you know, they, my kids use Instagram and other things that they don't tell me about because they don't want me to know about them. <laughs> I'm sure they're there. I think your old drunken uncle is on MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's your drunken grandpa. Yes, so go ahead. Um, have you found this to be true that a coping mechanism by your students is just not to read the news at all? Yeah, I think that's a danger too. That's kind of the cynicism part of it. And frankly, sometimes I tune it out myself. I feel myself getting too worked up. Um, you know, sometimes I have to take a break from it. So, yeah, uh, you know, they don't read newspapers. They, you know, they don't. Um, hey, do you give I, recommendations for how they should consume news? Yeah, I, I, I just encourage people to try to not tune out completely, to try to find, you know, some trusted sources. And, you know, for example, you could, you know, say something like, you know, well, the New York Times is an example, the Wall Street Journal or, or the Washington Post are, you know, and you can tear those apart. You can say all the things that are wrong with them about sources of information, about how they're biased, the mistakes they've made, um, anybody remember Jimmy's World from the Washington Post? Oh, yeah. It was a, a front page story, won a Pulitzer Prize about this eight-year-old heroin addict living in D.C. named Jimmy. Oh, and the, after the author won the Pulitzer Prize, they found out she made the whole thing up. Oh, wow. Like on 15 minutes of the wire. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, it's not like these things are infallible, but to, to say, you know, find some sources that you know are trustworthy, that you know have a, a high level of trust, that most of what they publish, you know, make up a number, 90% of what they publish, is pretty much straight up, yeah, that's, you know, I can trust that. If they say there's, that somebody is fighting a war in some country somewhere, I can be pretty sure that that's really happening. Those kind of sources, and, and use those as your, as your information major, at least refer to them, touch base with them. Especially when you're hearing something that's really out there, you know, um, it seems extreme or you're questioning it. Touch base with some of those sources, a variety of those sources. Another thing, it's interestingly enough, I hear students talking about doing some, some of the more sophisticated students, especially those who have a second language, is, oh yeah, I, I read El Pais. I read, um, I, I listen to German uh, news broadcasts on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, some, I, I listen to the BBC because I get a different perspective than I get from the US sources. So those are, are things you can, are, are ways that students cope too. Uh, not all students do that, but I've heard students mention that. That, like, yeah, the German, the, there's an English language German news broadcast, and it's got a very different perspective than the American broadcast. I listen to it. So, you know, you had a question? Oh. Yeah, I was just curious to know about like how you deal with changing curriculum when there's omissions in history, or say, for instance, for like students of color, yeah, who don't, you know, who are looking for their own history within like their Right, yeah, that's, well, you know, the curriculum is so crowded, and, and you, you know, it's doing, I think it's doing a better job of telling those stories. Um, but, but that's one of the great things about the internet, even something like Wikipedia, which has its problems, but you can go on Wikipedia and you can read about something like, um, you know, the, the, the war against indigenous people in El Salvador in the 20s and 30s, and actually find out some really good information about that that would never show up in a, a typical U.S. textbook because they just don't, it's long ago and people we don't really care about and it's not part of our history so we're not covering it. But you can go out there and find that and, 
And the great thing about something like Wikipedia is not only can you find out about this war that was conducted against the indigenous people, but you can then, typically in those articles, there's all these lists of sources that you can go to and find even more reliable and, and different voices talking about this. So there's a great opportunity, and I think maybe something I should have mentioned but didn't, is teaching students how to leverage all the information that's at their, at their disposal. It's, it's a problem that we're being hit with this fire hose of information. There's too much. We can't digest it all. But it's also a wonderful thing that we can go study something that's maybe to, to, to the, te the, the school textbook committee in Texas that shapes most of the textbooks in the United States because they're the biggest single buyer of textbooks. Oh. What's not important to them can still be found out there, and I can bring it into my world and understand it. And you know, one of the things about, I don't know if you know this story, <clears throat> Texas influences textbook content in the US because they're such a big buyer of textbooks. Before Texas became a real major player in this, the story of the Alamo was missing from US history textbooks. Because at that time, before Texas took over, it was New England that dominated. And New England was against the Mexican-American War, and they weren't really in favor of the Texas Revolution. The Alamo was not important to them. It, the Alamo doesn't show up until really the 40s and 50s when Texas really started to take over the textbook market. So very, you know, something that for, you know, the Alamo, of course, you know, part of everybody talks about it. No, not always. You know, it wasn't that well known. So that, that's how, you know, things like politics and, and money drive the information we get, you know, and. Yeah, it's, it's, the omission part of it is huge, and I, I hope I mentioned that somewhere in there, that you know, the, part, the problem with any news story is they can only tell so much. And right. I used an example of a, a news story that I came across recently. It was a really good New York Times article about a, a mass transportation proposed project in Nashville, Tennessee, that failed. The, the voters voted on it, and they voted it down. And it was a really good analysis of why it failed, and it had a lot of things going on. One thing was that the Koch brothers were financing anti-public transport initiative, but there was also uh, race issues, there was gentrification issues, the mayor who supported it got caught in a uh, miracle scandal right at the time of the election. Uh, There's all this stuff going on. And, you know, it was a really good article, but it's like, when I was reading it's like, man, I. I wish there was more than a paragraph about the racial side of this. I'd really like to understand how that wh how that worked. Because basically, black people in, in Nashville said no. They voted no. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing about it that was very interesting is, you know, most typically, the person who writes a news article doesn't get to write the headline. And the headline for the story was, Koch brothers oppose public transport. That was a small part of the story, really. It was a much richer and more interesting story. And like most news stories, you can't cover every angle of it. But you know, certainly for a student, what a great project, if, especially if you live in Nashville, to say, all right, I'm going to look at the racial aspect of why this failed and do a study of that. That would be a fascinating. You could do a master's thesis on that, I'm sure, if not a PhD. Because there are really interesting things to study out there that, that all fall in the cracks and we don't get to, to read about them. But in this great information-rich world, we have, at least have the opportunity. So we're out of time, but thank you so much for coming. Oh, and thanks, Todd. Oh, thank I appreciate you. it. Well, yeah. if anybody wants to email me, uh, I use email. It's old guy stuff. But uh, <laughs> you know, if you want to email me, ask me a question or whatever, or have a comment, I'd be glad to, to correspond with you. That's thank you all for your time. Instagram. <laughs> Instagram. Okay. You can Instagram my daughter. <laughs>